This is Natasha Kamey, a SEC Big Ten Big East official. Thank you for listening to the Crown Refs Podcast. Serve the game. Well, thanks for listening to the Crown Refs Podcast, the audio experience for basketball officials, as we are really excited to welcome you back to episode four of our new show called The Wonderful Women of Officiating. This series is dedicated to highlighting some of the amazing females of our officiating community and some of the great work that they're doing both on and off the basketball court. I am here with my guest, super talented eight-year official from the great city of Philadelphia, Natasha Kamey. Natasha, how are you, partner? How's it going, Paul? It's good to see you again. Pleasure having you with us today. And uh, just to make that connection, you know, in episode three, we had your coordinator in the SEC conference, Lisa right. Mattingly, who absolutely crushed that interview, by the way. And Hard spoke... act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> and she spoke extremely um, highly about you and your abilities. So if you could just take a few moments to share some words on, on Lisa and maybe a couple yeah. things you picked up from her along the way. Absolutely. I don't know if we want to take the whole episode because there's plenty to say. Uh, Lisa is a class act. Lisa is a woman of her word. Uh, I've got a chance to really get a chance to know Lisa the last couple of years. Um, I watched her growing up, you know, just watching all the games that she's done, WNBA, you know, NCAA, Final Fours, Finals. Uh, it was, if you, there was a game, Lisa was definitely on it. Um, so I already knew who she was, but these last few years, I've really gotten a chance to understand her as a person. Um, and having my opportunity at the SEC tournament got to engage a little bit more personally. Um, and there's a lot of overlap there. And um, the way that she leads, the way that she communicates definitely resonates with me. Um, the way that she has a plan for her staff, like most co coordinators out there, but you know, I know that I fit very well within that mold. Um, and she's just a fun person to be around. You know, I, I'm a Northeast girl, you know, Philly, born and raised, uh, been around some of the Southerners you know, make you kind of take a step back, right? And I uh, I give her a hard time about some of the words she uses uh, with that Southern tang, but, you know, it's just kind of the way it goes, right? Um, but no, I, I really enjoyed working for her. Like I said, I just kind of got rolling with her, but it feels like we picked up right where we should have, and um, I'm excited to continue. So uh, she's a great person, great person to work for, um, and I think she's going to do some really good things for women's basketball in regards to the staff and obviously growing the game. Well, thanks for sharing that and special thanks to Lisa for joining on, joining us on episode three. Really appreciate that. I just want to give a little context to the audience on your bio. Natasha has a six-year-old daughter named Mahari and a fiance named Siobhan. Three years ago, you went all in with officiating and if you've become a part of the small percentage of the industry that is fortunate enough to do this full-time, working yes. in numerous major and mid-major division one conferences, including, hold on. Big 10, SEC, ACC, Big 12, Conference USA, Big East, American, Sunbelt, A-10, CAA, MAC, Patriot League, America East, Ivy, NEC. Woo! Oh my God, I'm out of breath. Stop it. Just tell me uh, <laughs> what that means to you here in that it. list and kind of where you're at in your career right now. Uh, you know, each one of those conferences have a special place in my heart, honestly, because each one was a stepping stone to another one. Um, I worked for various people. You know, obviously we started out with Lisa, who is someone that I really admire and aspire to emulate some of my career off of, um, but also the other people that I work for, right? You know, those other conferences, I grew up in the A-10 and the Patriot League. That, those are my first two conferences. Uh, that was, I remember getting my first check from the Patriot League and it, and it being, you know, almost a thousand dollars and I like had a panic attack, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, when I do those games, man, they mean so much to me. I mean, those coaches have known me since I was you know, still trying to point out of bounds for the <laughs> right direction, you know? So uh, I skid my teeth on some of those things. And my first real playoff game was in the A-10. You know, I, I love that conference. You know, we have St. Joe's right nearby. So, you know, that's that's a home city for me. I love working at that conference as well. Um, you know, even Colonial, you know, we have Delaware and Trexel, you know, again, all very close schools to me. Um, and the Big Ten, I mean, the Big Ten is a conference, was my first major conference, right? That was my first conference game was in the Big Ten. So, you know, I, there's all these conferences mean, they all have their own story for me. You know, there's definitely some teams and some locations that I've been to that were first. 
Um, maybe I grew in a situation. Maybe there was an interaction with a coach who was newer or older that I learned from. Um, so although it <laughs> tongue in cheek is a long list, I'm, I'm grateful to be in all of them, really, truly. And um, to be able to kind of give back in certain scenarios, depending on what conference I'm in. Um, and then obviously learning so much, just being in the ACC, SEC, and Big Ten. I learned so much from those crews and obviously in the 12 as well, you know, because those are conferences that I'm I'm just kind of getting rolling in the Big Ten more than the others. But um, just being in those conferences, you work with such veteran crews um, that you really get a chance to learn from on a higher scale. So um, I'm grateful for all of them. I love every single one of them. Uh, each game, like I said, brings a new a new level of intensity uh, that you can love, but they're all great. They're all great. I just want to say congratulations. That's quite an impressive resume. I'm really happy for you having all those under your belt and being so young. It's got to be really exciting. So, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. I want to talk about Joey Crawford real quick. I had the honor to interview yeah. Joey <laughs> on a double episode, <laughs> 52 and 53. He has such great energy. We had a really candid conversation. So I have nothing but the utmost respect for Mr. Crawford. He's obviously a legend in our field and a fellow Philly native. So if you could just please right. talk about how Joey has inspired you. Yeah, I mean, Joey Crawford, like you said, I mean, again, another person you can go on and on and on about, right? Uh, <laughs> one of the first camps that I went to um, outside of obviously tryout camps, one of the first learning camps that I went to was Joey's camp. He used to have a camp out in Villanova great camp. It would be like 30, 40 of us, not, not too big. Um, and he really get a chance to get to know every single one of us. Right. Uh, and I don't even know if Joey knows this. I actually met Joey when I was 12, wow. he helped out on my AU team. So I played for the Comets, which is a lo local Delco area school. Uh, and he would come to our practices and teach us how to post up legally. And then also, you know, <laughs> Make sure you didn't give too much, but he was, a, he was a teacher. He was a giver. He was a facilitator. And I met him all those years in. And at that point, he was really in his prime, right? Like he was Joey Crawford. He was like the man. Not that he's not the man now, but like he was just getting rolling. You know, everyone really knew his name. Um, so to have him at our practices, I couldn't wait to go home and tell my mom, like, Joey Crawford was at my practice. <laughs> uh, so I admired him from adolescence, obviously, to still to this day, right? So, you know, when I got into officiating and got the chance to go to his teaching camp, man, I mean, <laughs> the, the notes that I still have from that, I think some of the notes that I had then are just now clicking, right? I mean, I've, I've had so many instances where you know, I'm like, damn, he said that before, you know, and I just, I didn't have the, um, the expertise or the uh, ability to really criminalize that, like, ability to put it on the floor and then also take those notes and make it real life, but, you know, Joey's just, he has so much information, and like I said before to you, like, anytime I've needed help on something, like, I had an issue with um, officiating screens correctly, you know, really seeing the whole play, picking up multiple defenders, you know, I'm, I'm elevating the speed of that I'm officiating now every night. So I really was trying to make sure that I was calling these correctly and, and work on my positioning and awareness. And uh, I reached out to him and he broke down maybe eight or nine clips, you know, and, I, and that guy's busy. He works for the NBA and his whole job is to break down film with that staff. So for him to take out that time and really sit with me and give me thorough email notes about screens and the importance of picking up multiple defenders and seeing plays before they happen, um, you know, just incredible information. And again, I, I don't know where I would be without just watching him, uh, the way he controls the game, you know, the things that I learned in that learning <laughs> in that teaching camp were incredible. You know, I think he had just teed up uh, Tim Duncan. So he talked about the emotional aspect of that, right? So, you know, we make mistakes every night. You and I could work a game and no one may see it or it may come up, maybe it won't, you know? But in the NBA, as we all know, in the pros, that stuff gets rerun a hundred times over. And this is before Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, right? Where there's going in on you. He, he had that before that. So, you know, he just talked about that mental journey, you know, and really kind of going back out there and, and not being afraid to make mistakes, you know, and standing in those moments. You know, one of the key takeaways I learned from him was being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I had no idea what that meant. And he showed a play where the ball's scrambling and 
bodies are all over the floor and the officials didn't make a call until there was an obvious call, right? And he said to us, you know, how uncomfortable are you watching this right now? Don't you feel like, oh, that could be a hit. Oh, that could be a hold. Oh, he's like, you feel that uncomfortableness? You're going to have that on the court. You got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I was like, man, I don't know about that. But I mean, that has resonated through my entire career. There's so many moments where everyone's on edge waiting for the next thing. And sometimes it's nothing, right? Sometimes the ball spills out and it's just going to be out of bounds. Or sometimes you got to make that hard call that, you know, it's not going to make anyone happy, but it's the right call, right? So you got to stand in that moment and be comfortable in those uncomfortable situations. And that was one of the biggest takeaways I got from him. That's such a great tip, being uncomfortable or being comfortable when you're uncomfortable. If you can yeah. do that, be comfortable in chaos, then you're going to be comfortable 100% of the time, right? Yes, without a doubt. In our game, there's plenty of those moments to come around. So it's no, no less than that. <laughs> it's funny, when you were uh, mentioning Joey Crawford was giving post-up tips, I was like, hmm, he used to be a post <laughs> player. And then it makes sense that he was given from an officiating perspective. That's yeah, 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 for sure. I worked 12, so like, you know post up really you know what I mean <laughs> but it was great he was of course engaging enthusiastic he was Joey you know straight to the point you know no chaser which I love so now as you started to move up the ladder uh from division two to mid-major division one and then making that big transition and jump into yeah. the power five conferences talk about what Tina Napier and Laura Morris have meant to you and what you've learned from them about how to run the game absolutely so you know um Back to Lisa, she kind of uh, gave Laura me as her project, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that because I think there's a lot of uh, similarities we have as personalities. So, you know, we're both cancers. We both are very caring people. Uh, and we both enjoy being good partners. Um, but we also know the importance of a balance of communication with empathy and then also with strength, right? And so, you know, that learning from her and watching her within games, we've had many of battles just in the last three years. Um, some of my hardest games are with Laura and I, I'm very grateful for that leadership with her because you know there's times in that you need to say, hey, Tosh, that's not, that's not the right call. And then there's times that I just kind of really need a, a, a pep up, you know, a little pep talk. And she kind of knows the difference of when those times are needed. And um, you know, I, I'm grateful for at least aligning those two things together, seeing that within both of us and knowing that we could benefit from each other um, in those scenarios. And then, you know, Tina is, I mean, she is a play caller. Sorry, okay? Tina, not Tina, Tina. Sorry, my bad. Tina, yes. <laughs> wasn't me, Tina. Just putting it out there. Wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> it's all good. Uh, Tina is a play caller, man. I mean, she just runs the game. I had some, I had some games with her this year and, uh, I jokingly said she yelled at me because she just runs the game, man. And I'm like, Tina, I'm trying to tell you that we're in the bonus. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're shooting. Yeah. But it's just like, that's just how she is. She's not going to have any mistakes. She's not going to let anything go unseen. If there's an opportunity to go to the monitor, because we need to go to the monitor, we're going. Right? That's it. It's not really a debate. You're just kind of going. And I love that. You know, kind of going back off of the uh, aggressiveness of Joey. Like, I'm from Philly. You know, I, I need someone to just be straight up with me. That's the best way for me to learn. And uh, Tyna is just doing her job and doing it well. And I think that, you know, just being able to work with her for some playoff games this year, we had like a week straight at the end of the season that we were together. And I felt like my game grew exponentially just from that week, you know, mm -hmm. just really her timing of her whistle. And like I said, just running the game, you know, and at that level, you know, she has all the credibility she needs. And um, hopefully one day I have the same credibility, good, bad, or indifferent, but just knowing that she still makes mistakes and she, takes ownership of that but she also makes sure that the game is taken care of and she lets it work you know and that's one of the best things of working with you know a lot of the people that I've um, grown from and learned from they let you work and that's the only way I'm going to learn you know is being able to kind of make those mistakes obviously not too bad right but in, in a way that I can kind of bounce back and really get that lesson that's going to be there so I just want to say uh, rest in peace to Rochelle Jones, who was an incredible referee that got the opportunity to work her first Final Four in 2017 in Dallas. And unfortunately, the next year, due to cancer, passed away. So just to keep her spirit and legacy going, I know you learned many things from your time working games with Rochelle Jones. Just talk about her influence on you, what she taught you um, about being yeah. a great partner. For sure. Uh, Rochelle was 
an amazing person. You know, just if you ask any of us who got a chance to work with her, know her, um, she was just an amazing person. And, uh, you know, that was, I've, I've have had some loss within my life personally with my family and, and friends. Um, but that was also a, another hit. You know, I, none of us saw it coming. Uh, like, like you just mentioned, she had just sat for the final four. So we thought, man, this is the turnaround. Um, and we all know how cancer goes. It can go up and it can go down. Um, and, you know, cancer has affected our, our side of things for multiple people, you know, her. And then we had Denise who got sick as well, who thank God has bounced back and is doing very well since then. Um, but we just didn't know how that was going to go. But my interactions with Rachel were always positive. Another cancer. We were two days apart for her birthday. Um, and she was silly and she was outgoing. And she was a mom who was, you know, always worried about making sure that everyone felt comfortable. Um, and that you that you understood what the playing field was, right? You know, because I was trying to get in, just trying to just try to have a seat at the table, any at any table. Right. Um, and Rachel always was honest with me, you know, Tasha, they really want you to do this. So Tasha, you should change this. Or, you know, this is what I've noticed, you know, those little tips that maybe you don't necessarily get. Um, she was always willing to give that to me and, and abundantly. Right. Um, I remember I did the division two national championship and I didn't call her right away. Hmm. And she, you know, gave me a little bit of an earful when I saw her in the final four, like, Hey, and I was like, you're hundred percent right. It's my bad. I'm so sorry. Uh, but, you know, she kept me honest, you know, and I love that about her. I love that she was caring, but she also um, made sure that you, you know, you were honest with her as well. And um, one of the best things that she taught me um, was that you have to take care of your table, right? So your table can make or break your game. And I, I think that we all kind of know that. But she had had an instance where that actually hurt her, you know, in a big game, like her table just let her down. Um, and it was no one's fault, but it's just the way that she had to learn how to handle that. So one of the things that I learned from her was just, you have to treat your table like service, like as though you were waiting on a table, right? You got to make sure they are refreshed. You got to make sure that they're alert. You got to make sure we're on the same page. You got to make sure that even if they make mistakes, that you're still encouraging, right? Because if they, you know, don't stop that clock when they're supposed to, you know, you got, you got a situation on your hands. You go to the monitor and it's out, you know, now everyone's looking at the table and the last thing they need is you coming over here berating them, telling them how bad of a job they're doing, right? And not that that's even in my nature, but just understanding that they have that same pressure too. Just because we're on the floor and we're making the calls and everyone sees us, you know, it's kind of like the sound guy. Uh, no, one under, no one knows the sound guy until the sound doesn't work. Right. If you go to a concert, you're like, ah, this is great. The sound stops working. All of a sudden, who's the sound guy? You know, it's the same thing with the clock and the table. No one knows who the table is. They may never make a mark for 40 games. And the 45th game, it's UConn versus Tennessee, and the clock goes out. Everyone's who's the table? Like you can't you can't forget about them because they matter, but you got to respect them at the same time. You know, you got to make sure that you give them that same humility and that same grace that you would give your partner if they made a bad call. And uh, her stress and that importance of just being a good partner, not just to your partners, but obviously the partners on the sidelines as well, was very key for my development. That's some of the greatest um, table advice that I've heard thinking about it, like service and, and a waiter or a waitress, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they're on our team. It's also great yeah. to remember their names. So instead of saying, yes. can, you, can you adjust the shot clock 24? Denise, yep. can you please put the shot clock at 24? It just sounds yep. so much better. And they're more encouraged yeah, yeah. to want to help. Yep. And if you remember their name coming back, you know, I, re I try to remember at least the DV sport guys, you know, like, oh, I saw you at, uh, you worked at Fordham as well, right? Yeah. Like just the fact that you have that wherewithal to remember, you know, like I, obviously everyone wants to feel like they matter. I mean, that's just a general thing. But like I said, they're, they're the people who don't get that, that information, that praise. And we can be better stewards of the game by just making sure we acknowledge them. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, with our audience. Sure. Really appreciate hearing that. Um, you listed so yeah. many great names. I want to make sure we can acknowledge most of them. I want to mention a few more names so you can share any yeah. nuggets and gems that they left you so then we can go yeah. pay, pay it forward with the audience. <laughs> um, sure. You mentioned Gina Cross, Felicia Grinter, Beverly Roberts, Mash Forsberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, my Beverly, Jenna, Fifi, as, as I lovingly call her, all great women officials, all great people. Um, 
you know, they've all given me some nuggets here and there. Just, you know, staying calm the way that Mai does. And, and like I said, in regards of staying comfortable in uncomfortable situations, you know, Fifi is, is a, a great, strong official. She's a great R. She's, uh, again, been around forever. Um, so she just knows the landscape of the SEC, Big Ten, you know, the two conferences that I work heavily in. So she's really been very helpful just understanding the layout of that. Um, you know, Jenna, I met Jenna in my first camp for trying out for Patty and she, you know, took me under her wing and made sure I didn't do anything stupid. And I was very grateful for that. Um, and, you know, it's, and Beverly has just been such a, a sounding board for me. Um, you know, just trying to understand, like after my second game for the NCAA tournament, I texted her and said, wow, second round is a different beast, huh? She's like, just getting started, you know? So just kind of being able to kind of express that to her was just, um, easy going you know sometimes you say that to someone or like oh you know maybe you think they're gonna think oh you shouldn't be there you know but she was very uh empathetic and was like <laughs> you're just getting started like you know the ball's just rolling now and then you got that on your belt it's, it's only getting tougher from here so super appreciative of that and i would be remiss if i didn't mention brian garland you know he's my sounding board uh confidant in many ways you know as you know all this business can drive you a little crazy so uh, I call him whenever I'm like, man, am I crazy or is this really happening? Or uh, did I handle the situation correctly? Or, you know, what could I have done differently? Or just even trying to navigate distance from one school to another is it even physically possible to get there, right? Uh, Brian's always there for me. He's a family member. He's like a brother to me. Um, and so all these people, you know, have helped me and shaped me as an official and like I said, there's just so many people that I got things from on my journey, which is why I'm so grateful that I was able to kind of do each step because I learned so many things from so many people, you know, people who are still in the game, people who aren't in the game anymore. And, you know, for myself, one of the one main reasons I wanted to do this is that maybe someone takes one thing away from what I said today, wherever they are in their path, whether they're past me, behind me, same path, whatever, you know, those things can just help give you a broader view, give you a better idea of what to expect, and then other ways to handle situations that you may not have thought of. So, you know, I'm grateful to every single one of them and the names that, you know, unfortunately, you know, kind of fly by, but, you know, I'm so grateful for just our community of officials who always help out, always give back. You know, we have such a great community and the veterans who are in this game, you know, they did a very good job of sharing the nuggets as they went along. And I'm grateful for that. I'm sure you'll get more than one person to pick up one thing. I already got 12. Right now, <laughs> Stop. <so>. <laughs> What's the difference between the second round and the first round? What was the major? Man, the listen, the first round, you know, and I, and I hope people take this the right way because, you know, you never know, right? But the first round is like, everyone's just happy to be there, bro. You know, the teams work their butts off to get there. You know, sometimes you have very, um, not this year, this year is a little intense, but in years past, you've had years where there's 12 versus one. So like, you know, they're there gotcha. to be there mm -hmm. and they hope they win, but cards are what they are. So like the first round can be very, you know, um, and thankfully in our game, it's gotten a lot smaller that gap, but, you know, even with some of the, the, um, the matchups, they can be a little lopsided, right? So the first game is really, I mean, my first game was hard because again, I was, I was in the West coast. I had had none of the teams that were there. I knew none of the people that I worked with. Um, and I just like was really a fish out of water. So it was definitely difficult in that regard. Um, but it was still basketball. So basketball is basketball, but the first game was like fun, you know? And so the second game I had had, obviously one of the teams from the first round to the second round. And I mean, just his interaction with me, I was like, wow, this is different, you know, because now it's like, oh, he's got to go to the regional, you know, like this guy's got to get out of the bowl here and get to the Sweet 16. And that intensity just, it cranked up two or three levels. I thought it'd be another level, but not like five or six. Uh, and so by the time we got done that game, after that game, me and my crew were like on the ground, like laying down, just like, mm -hmm. woo. We did it, <laughs> you know, and uh, it was just an amazing experience. I mean, anytime you get to do a really fun matchup is an amazing experience, but that was probably my most intense game at, at, to that point. 
And I was super, super grateful for just being able to be in that position, but also <laughs> be able to recognize the difference between one and two is definitely something to, to aspire to. And how did your postseason um, turn out this year? Did you work in the tournament again? Yeah, yeah. So they took a smaller pool of officials. Uh, definitely a, a tight, tight race this year. So I was very grateful to make that top 60. Uh, I did the first two rounds again, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and I also got to do a WNIT final, which was on my bucket list. So uh, came a little sooner than I thought it would, but I was very grateful for the opportunity. I've worked with an amazing crew. It was a great game. Uh, we haven't had fans all year. And this year, there was probably 600 fans in a high school gym, if you can imagine. So it was packed. <laughs> we walked out. I was like, okay. Um, haven't had fans in a while. <laughs> so uh, it was very, it was awesome. I can't ask for better. My season was great. Let's get into some of the aspects of officiating that you're passionate about. You mentioned sure. growing the winning, women's game in all forms from media yeah. to exposure to stories to raising the overall number of quality officials. Natasha, you're talking my language. Let's get a little <laughs> deeper into what your vision is and how you want to make that happen. Sure. I mean, I think um, I think one of the best ways to do that, you know, a lot of times you talk about bringing like old um, players, you know, people who are in basketball administrators who might be interested. We've had coaches come into our game. Um, I think just creating a way to streamline that appropriately, right? So like, I'll give you an example right now. If you start out in officiating, you might see the camps that are available as tryout camps. These camps are ability for you to get hired. They're not the way for you to get taught the fundamentals, right? And for me, you know, if I had gone to Patty's camp right out the gate, I don't know if, I don't know what she would have thought of me, right? You know, I didn't go to that camp until I was ready. You know, and I got a chance to do, you know, like the bitty ball and the high school and the juco and all that. And I know that sometimes um, people want to kind of skip some of those steps and to each his own because I've I've helped young women skip some of those steps and they've turned out fine. Um, for me, it was better for me to kind of learn each step because, again, I can kind of get some of the kinks out. Um, but I think just in regards of trying to figure out how to get started. Right. I would like to have us create something that was actually a blueprint. Right. If you think about being a lawyer, if you think about being, uh, you know, an astronaut, right? You go to school, you study, there's these quizzes, you know, then you elevate to this and you, or if you're um, a doctor, you're, you know, underneath another doctor, and then maybe you can work in the hospital yourself and then maybe get your own practice. There's actual steps, right? For us, there are no steps. And I think that sometimes people get lost in that transition and that little bit of, um, unknowing, right? There's some things that are just specific to our business that you just don't do, right? You don't send emails to your coordinator without talking to your crew chief, <laughs> like, you know, you, you don't about a game or a situation that happens in the game, right? You don't, um, uh, you don't send clips, you know, just to one partner. You make sure that you guys talk about it as a whole. These are things that people can make easily mistakes. They're not, maybe it's not in malicious tent, but it can be taken as such. And again, you know, seeing some of the people that I came up with making those mistakes myself, you know, is unfair to allow people to be as successful as they can be because you can get a reputation for something that you didn't even know was wrong, right? You, you can do something that's not necessarily looked at as the best thing to do in those scenarios. So I would love to, you know, once I transition from this game, whatever that shall be, God willing, um, to have set up a streamline. You know, not everybody has to be, you know, national championship official, but they can be the best division two official on the planet mm -hmm. and have valuable information to give and a valuable uh, contribution to their area or local officials. And that can still grow the game, right? Like we can watch those games and not feel like, man, if that person just knew, you know, or if they knew how to break down film or if there was a way for them to understand the complexity of clock management, you know, just things that you don't know until you know, right? And I think that a lot of times we go to these camps, we try out for these camps, myself included, you know, when it was my turn, you know, just wanted to be on, just wanted to get an opportunity. But you shouldn't go to something that you're not prepared for. Because even if you get in those scenarios, it's not about getting there, it's about staying there, right? So you can get in all these conferences, you can be in all the conferences I'm in, if not more, but if you can't stay, 
then was it really worth it? Right. So I would want people to spend their money and invest in themselves in a way that allows them to stay, not just get there, but stay and grow the game. Right. Reach out to those ex players and give them an actual guideline. Think about these players. They know that they, if they play really well in high school, they send a couple film out, they get a recruiting schedule, they talk to a couple of coaches, they make an announcement. There's steps, right? When they come out to be officials, what are the steps? Does anyone really know? There isn't, right? And so it's it doesn't have to end and you know the ultimate prize. You know, not everybody wants to do what it takes to do what I do or what you do, right? But they can still be really good at where they are. And I think that people, when they go into something, they still want to do a good job. I think human beings are naturally drawn to do so. And I think that if we can provide them the tools, the information, the resources to ensure that they feel comfortable doing a good job, a quality job, that our game as a whole will grow, right? The quality of the game grows. The players know what to expect. The coaches know what to expect. The, the spectators know what to expect, right? We're preparing people to be successful at whatever level they are. So, you know, my, my hope is to try to streamline that. And then obviously with diversity and equality, you know, that's a big thing going on in society right now. And, you know, obviously that's something that has always been, you know, something that is a concern for all of us. <clears throat> but I think that, you know, for us, it's just making sure that the opportunities are there, right? So, you know, just if Natasha Kami doesn't work out and I just, you know, completely blow it, you know, I hope that they give another Natasha Kami another chance, right? We can't just give one of me a chance. We have to give multiple people a chance. And, you know, they may not even look like me, right? Maybe they have a lower haircut. Maybe they are, you know, a little bit more of an androgynous style, right? They deserve a shot as well. We're not all going to fit in one box, but we might all have that talent. And the most important thing is just allowing ourselves to see different renditions of what women can look like. You know, you know there's all different types of women. There's all different sizes of women. Um, you know, women like to dress in certain ways, certain hairstyles, certain hair colors. And if you think about the players that we officiate, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. Some players are tatted. Some players are, you know, wear eyelashes. Some players wear lipstick. Some players, you know, you can't really tell if they are angry or not. You know, they just have like a mean look, you know. But if they see themselves in us, imagine what they could emulate. Imagine what they could aspire to. And I think that anytime you're talking about diversity, and inclusion and equality, you want to give people um, examples of what they can be, right? So the more that we have people empowered, more that we see women coordinators and more women can aspire to be coordinators. The more that we see women ADs, more women can aspire to be ADs. You know, it's just kind of goes hand in hand. And I think that this is the perfect time to try to give more opportunity to people who may not have always had those opportunities. And I think there's this place for everyone. I think there's a place for someone like you, Paul. I think there's a place for someone like me and we can all live harmoniously. I just think that, you know, we've all could do a better job of just being inclusive and allowing more people who haven't always had that opportunity to come through and really make a mark and really give these young ladies something to aspire to be as well. Not just, you know, going to play overseas. You can actually give back to the game by refereeing as well. Said a lot of great things from, you know, trying to be the best D2 referee or the best high school referee everybody thinks it has to be at the highest level you can find happiness at any level just try to be the best version of yourself said a lot of great things about equality diversity inclusion you know i try to make crown refs an all-inclusive place for all referees nba to cyo and everything in between i wanted to create like one singular room for referees yeah. mm -hmm. um you know, I know you also mentioned you know media and stories so i just started thinking when is the natasha kami podcast ah. now Listen here, I said, what was one of the first Listen things I said to you? What was the first thing I said to you? I said, how did you find me? Literally, this is, <laughs> I try my best to just do my job, help the people that I'm helping and just leave my mark that way. But I, you know, Paul, if anyone's going to find me, it's going to be you, bro. So I'm a good, I'm a good Google searcher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. <laughs> Natasha, let's bring value about a topic um, about having setbacks and how yeah. we view how we view losing. I'm a big believer in finding the positive in every situation, 
where there is visible failure, there is hidden opportunities. You just have to create it in your own mind and adjust your perspective in that moment. Could you share about the importance of having self-confidence and never giving up on yourself? For sure. Uh, you know, I feel like that's like the saga to my life. You know, I've, I've had many of setbacks, kind of like I alluded, I, I lost my brother at 17. I was supposed to go to Paris that same summer, actually two weeks after he had passed and we didn't have enough money because I had to pay for the funeral. Uh, I moved every four years as a child just because my mom changed jobs often. Um, so I never really had like childhood friends per se, but it allowed me to be able to kind of really get along with anyone, which I'm super grateful for. Uh, you know, I learned a lot from losing my brother and, and, and changed obviously the dynamics of our family, but it made me a, a better person, I feel as though. Um, and then, you know, just on my team at college, you know, just kind of getting officiating. There was always something that I was missing. It was always one last thing I had to do. Um, and whether I figured that out or found that out was always, you know, kind of difficult to figure, you know, on your own. Um, so setbacks are, are just part of life. And I had read a really good book uh, maybe about five years ago. It was about climbing Mount Everest. I don't know if you ever read that book before. It's Not like the book, but I know Mount Everest. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, I can't, the name is escaping me, but it's an excellent book. So everyone thinks that when you climb Mount Everest, you just go straight up and come straight down. That is the exact opposite of what you do. Uh, you go to the mountain, you have to wait for the storm. Sometimes you go up, sometimes you have to come back down. Sometimes you wait 20 hours, sometimes you wait four days. It's an entire two month experience. And getting to the top is just the beginning because now you have to come back. Wow. Right. And so the book really captures the importance of just because your your track record is going up and down. Right. It's a little squiggly. Right. Doesn't mean that you're not still going forward. It just means that you're going at the rate that you're expected mm -hmm. to go. So, yes, I wanted to get to the highest pinnacle. Yes, I'm still striving to get to the highest pinnacle. And even when I was giving you my resume, I thought to myself, I don't give myself enough credit, you know, but when you're so laser focused on trying to get to the top, you forget that there are going to be moments where you have to just sit back and wait. There has to be moments where, you know, you make incremental progress and sometimes you got to come back down and wait for the storm to come back through. Right. And so I've had coordinators change, right. I build this rapport with, with whomever, and then they retire or maybe someone else gets a job. And now I'm like, oh man, here we go, right? And so, you know, thankfully I've been able to weather that storm, but there aren't officials that were able to kind of navigate that, you know? And it's unfortunate because that just comes with the gig. It's like anything, like you get a new boss at your job, you know, some people get fired, some people stay, some people get hired. It's just how it goes. But, you know, being able to kind of stay in that moment, you know, pivot when you have a situation that doesn't necessarily work out or it's not working out. You know, maybe, you know, I wanted to stay in a certain conference and it wasn't benefiting me anymore. I wasn't getting, you know, the experience that, you know, I was aspiring to get, but another conference offered me that opportunity. You can't be scared to do, do what you need to do for your career and for your business, you know? And so for me, I look at setbacks, you know, again, just reading that book, it's just kind of seeing it from a, from a bigger lens, you know, trying not to just hone in on what's going wrong, but what can I take away from this scenario? You know, how can I grow? How could I have handled this better? How can I communicate next time this situation might arise so that I don't necessarily make those same mistakes? I want to be better as a person. And, you know, the setbacks that I've experienced personally and professionally, you know, I'm grateful for. You know, I don't see them as a loss. I see them as a learning experience. And I think that it just contributes to my ability to help others, to be able to reason with others, to tell them, hey, I know, Right now, it feels like it's the end of the world, but I'm telling you, there's more people to work for. There's more games coming, you know, and God willing, if you see another season, this is your next shot. You know, maybe so-and-so didn't pick you up this year. What can you do differently? What can you control? You know, and for me, I was trying to break through. I was trying to get to the highest level that I could in multiple conferences. I just couldn't get through. I couldn't understand what it could be, you know, what I was doing wrong. And like I said, people were giving me nuggets here and there. And finally, I just said to myself, I gotta be Natasha, man. I just gotta, I gotta blow the whistle the way I blow. I gotta hit that mechanic the way that I do. I gotta 
use my voice with my tone. Um, I gotta be able to smile. I gotta be able to be stern. I gotta be able to just be myself, which is a balance of many things. And I think that once that light bulb went off, once I realized that the best version to give these guys to hire me was me, I mean, there's been no turning back. And I feel great knowing that every single person I work for knows who I am. Right, they're not getting a rendition of Natasha. They're not getting, you know, this Natasha that works in the ACC. It's just me, I'm the same official I was yesterday as I was tomorrow night, or you know, several nights ago. It's just me, you know. And I think coaches can respect that. I think my partners can respect that because I don't want anyone ever to feel like they they don't understand who they're going to get out of me, you know. And I'm just going to do the best that I can at that. And so, you know, without that setback. I could have tried to mirror other people and, and maybe I would have gotten far or even further than I am now. Um, but you know what? That wouldn't have been true to who I am. And so uh, I'm really grateful for the setbacks that I've had. And uh, again, like I said, they're lessons. So bring them on. 20 second water break. 20 second water break. Sweet. You said some great things about your failures and what helped you break through. And it was actually quite simple when the light bulb went off for you. It was just to be yourself. And you said a really emotionally intelligent line that resonated with me. And that's failure and disappointment is all a way of thinking. Just go a little bit deeper into that mindset. And what would you say and what advice would you have for the official who's scared to kind of really show them true selves? Absolutely. Um, you know, kind of what I was mentioning before about me understanding that I was the best version of being the greatest official for myself, right? And so, you know, fear can really take over. It can really control your emotions, your response to different scenarios. If you allow that fear to fester and, and dictate how you're going to navigate what you're willing to do on the floor and off the floor, right? So if you're feeling fearful or unsure, you know, take a moment and just think to yourself, you know, what, what do I want to do? How would I want to receive this information? How would I want myself to look on camera when I go back and look at this film of my body movement, of my head, of how I'm standing, at my projection, at how far I am from them, right? You know, when I would watch some of my DVDs back in the day, uh, mine would be a test. Mine would be Hey, oh man, you got me beat, bro. You got me beat. Good, you got me beat. Those <laughs> DVDs were hard to track down, by the way. Those schools were not feeling it. So there's that. Mm -hmm. Uh but we got them. We're gonna make it work as we always do. Um but when I had to get those DVDs just looking at my my posture, right? You know, maybe I was saying something to a coach to make them believe. Um but look at look at how my shoulders were slumped. You know, look at how uh, my distance was. I looked unsure, right? So think to yourself when if you can replay that, why would I want to do that? You know, you if you talk to your mom or your parents or if you're a manager at work, you'd be surprised how many officials are actual, you know, managers or teachers. You know, they dictate an entire room on a daily basis. Then sometimes we get on the court and we don't use those same characteristics and tools on the floor. That's why you're great at your job, right? Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that what you bring to the table is you. All of your life experiences, all the things that I've went through as an individual to become the person that I am today is why I can excel at my job because it's, it's groomed me to be who I am. So don't take away from that, right? Maybe the way that you want to answer that scenario won't be the right way. It's okay. You're going to learn from that scenario right? You don't need to keep yelling back at coaches every time. <laughs> you might want to bring that back a little bit, but as long as you're open to information, as long as you're open to growing, the moment you close that brain off, you're dead, man. That's it. It's nothing else to give because your growth has stopped tremendously. So yes, make mistakes. Yes, have fear, but allow yourself to really channel that. You know, I started meditating before games about two years ago, and I, I don't know how people feel about meditation, you know, to each his own, obviously, but having a clear mind, you know, we used to say all the time, I can't, you know, leave the drama at the door and come in with a fresh mind. But no one ever said exactly how you do that. What are some tricks to do that? What are some tools I can do to do that, right? So again, taking the many uh, ref-isms and trying to break that down logistically to how that can actually happen for an individual. For me, it was meditating. For some other people, it might be prayer. For others, it might be the best playlist of playlists to really just get loose and relax, right? 
because the game's going to be tense enough, right? You're going to make enough mistakes as it is. Uh, Al Batista told me a great tip, again, pulling from different people. Watch clips, watch like 10 clips in a row of plays you got right before a game. <laughs> Wonders. <laughs> Wonders. Because you're going to go out there, you might keep the first block charge of the game. Here we go, right? But if you watch 10 clips before the game of stuff that you got right, mechanics that you did correct, clocks that you fixed, mm. communication that you handled well with the coach, all these just little nuggets right before the game. I'm telling you the amount of confidence that it fills you with because it's only, it's you, right? You're not trying to emulate another official, you're emulating yourself. And you can show yourself that you've done it correctly before and you can do it correctly again. And if that's what helps you clear your mind, if that's what helps you combat your fear, excellent. If meditation for 15 minutes in the car before you walk in is what you need to clear your mind, excellent. Find your thing. Find your thing to let yourself leave that at the door and bring your best self inside because you don't have room for fear. I don't know about you, Paul, but when I'm out there, I got many things going on in this head as the ball is being dribbled to the floor. I don't have room for fear in my mind. I got room to be as accurate as I can be, to be a good partner, and to make sure that I can control this game the best way that I can. That's it. Fear doesn't have space up in here. I, I, I don't have it. I'm not that, maybe I'm not that smart. I don't know, but you got you to gotta, you gotta shift out some of that stuff. Some of that stuff's got to wait. It's got to wait for later. You know what fear stands for? What's it stand for? False evidence appearing real. There you go. There That's you go. a refism. Put a bullet point next to that. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to start using that word, I think, on every podcast now. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You got to, you just, you know, you got to figure out what your thing is. You know, we're all so different. So I could tell someone to meditate. And they're like, I don't want to do that. Someone told me to meditate. And I thought, you're crazy. You know, but the more I started implementing stretching and yoga, it helped out. You know, the older I became, obviously, the slower I needed to slow things down. I was like, yoga works. Meditation works. Wow. Phenomenal, you know, and just again, the anxiety and, and the tense atmosphere they're right in sometimes is, is hard to explain to outside people. But as officials, we all know it oh too well. So we got to clear our mind, man. We got to do what we need to do to make sure that we, we keep that fear out of there. No room for that here. And that Al, that Al guy, he's good. Yeah, <laughs> Al, phenomenal, phenomenal. I mean, like just a breath of information this guy i mean every time i see him i learn another thing i'm like ow does it ever stop bro does it ever stop never does i love it i love it he's like a wizard he is he is al saw something in me man i was in the grind of it all really truly and he was like listen you need to put yourself out there you need to make sure that you believe in your abilities you you got it man you just you got to see it and so he sent me to a camp down in Florida. I forget. It was one of the pro men camp. I went down there and I mean, they put me on the championship game the first time I was there. And I was like, oh, wait. And he's like, this is what I'm talking about. You don't believe in yourself. You, everyone else sees it but you. And I was like, I guess you're right. So just giving me that confidence, just, you know, an outside guy who just sees hundreds and thousands of officials, right? We all know how many games he watches. So to hear that from someone who actually has a Rolodex of officials you see is, means something. So I love Al. He's a great guy. Great guy. They put you on the championship game as they should. Nah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm probably a lot better now than I was then, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Appreciate it nonetheless. I just want to make sure Natasha is giving Natasha enough credit. Oh, thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate that. Got you. <laughs> I know you uh, do a lot of traveling and work with many different partners. Do you have any moments or referee stories that stand out over your career you'd like to share? Man, we've had some journeys, man. You know, uh, I, I work with, like I said, a lot of veteran officials. I've had coordinators who put me with some really great veterans who have taught me some really good stuff. Uh, I worked with um, Kathy Lynch, who has retired from the game. She's a, from Erie PA. Uh, and Kathy Lonigan on a game up north. I think we were in America East game, probably Vermont. And uh, we were traveling. And the travel is so extensive. I mean, it, it can really be burdensome at times. Uh, but we all went up to a game. We had dinner. We, um, 
obviously did the game. We did a very nice job on the game. They taught me how to talk to the coordinator after the game. So I got some, some nuggets from them afterwards. Um, but we, Kathy and I continued on, uh, Kathy Lonergan, they're both Kathy. Um, and so we were going up to um, like upstate New York. And I was pretty, I was, it was probably around January. That's probably when I'm the least happiest that I am <laughs> at that time. I'm just, I'm beating up. We're getting into conference play. You don't know if you're going to make playoffs or not. You're just you're feeling a little on it, you know? And she could sense that for me. So not only does Lana get to make cupcakes and brownies and treats all season, which is, you know, oh, you got to make sure you eat that in small bites, right? But we're going up. She gets this hotel for us. It's a suite, right? The suite includes a dinner with wine. Now, I know, to the average person, you think to yourself, wow, dinner and wine sounds like a lot. It was the best thing she could have told me. I was like, why are we not down there now? You know, uh, because I just needed that interaction. I needed to be able to sit with someone, not in my car eating Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, Panera. Like I wanted to be able to sit at a table, have a fork in my hand, a real fork, classic book, real <laughs> fork, and have a conversation with someone that also shares in this job that I do. Because obviously when you come home, you're talking about home things and family and whatnot, but to have someone else who also has been in this business for a long time to express the same um, areas of concern that we both were having at that time, to talk about the games that we had went, but the fact that she made sure that we had a suite and made sure that we had dinner and freaking movie I was the happiest person ever. And I could never be more grateful for her. And again, learning from the veterans, just being a good partner, you know, recognizing when your partner might be coming from a four day trip, you know, maybe you go pick them up at the, at the airport. Maybe they don't get the car this time. Maybe you get the car, right? Maybe this time you set up the plans for where we're going to stay and how, what time we're going to leave. Cause they're exhausted. Cause you've just, you, they come off for four days. You just getting started, you know, just recognizing those things. Right. And it's stories like that, that, man, I mean, it just, it makes me excited. It makes my heart warm just thinking about it because it cost her nothing to do that. And yeah, it was everything to me, right? It was everything to me to just have that moment with her, have that moment with them as we're laughing in the car, you know, we're playing songs too loud. You know, It's just, it's pandemonium, right? But if we get to the game, we do our job and we get out of there, you know, and you, you just, the job is a grind and it's a great grind. And if you love basketball, it's the best thing ever. But the people that you get to interact with, the stories that you get to have, the cities that you get to have an adventure in, you know, every city that I go to pre-COVID, I tried to, uh, you know, get a little history on there. You know, I was in Memphis and um, I went down to Beale Street, you know, and it's like historically Black Street and they have uh, all types of seafood, they have music playing, this is all before the game, you know. And uh, I got a chance just to see it. You know, why not? It's my first time in Memphis. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, I went to St. Louis. They're known for the barbecue. I asked the uh, person who was evaluating what's the best barbecue in, in Missouri. He took us there, me and my crew. We threw down now my stomach, you know, different story. But <laughs> the food was fantastic. It was worth it. You know, it was worth just having that camaraderie. There's so many times that we just get in and we get out. And I understand there are times for that, but. You know, I jokingly said to a couple partners that I saw throughout the year, you know, I miss you picking me up, man. We used to have some good talks in the car. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, some folks that were from that area, like when I go to Texas, you know, as you know, everything's big in Texas. Mm -hmm. So the Texans always have a great spot to eat. Uh, and they they take me to wherever they go. You know, I do the same thing in Philly. I take people to get a cheesesteak, take them to get a proper meal, you know, make sure that they've been somewhere. Do you know uh, your pets? Come on, man. I don't know. We don't, do the, we don't do the franchises here, bro. We don't do that around here. Delisandro's all day. Okay. Yes. All right. You're a yes, real yes. Philadelphian. You're, oh, you're giving me a third party race. answer. Born and raised. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken crews to Reading Terminal. This one time I took my, my really good friend, Capolino, John Capolino on the women's side, uh, Maggie Teeman to uh, Reading Terminal, which is right by the Pulaster, actually. And um, we were working at the plus for that day. I took Maggie and John to Reading Terminal, got them cheesesteaks, got them bagels, got them all the things. Hmm. Me and Capolino threw down. We had a great time. You know, whatever. Uh, Maggie doesn't eat this type of food. So she's got 
a food baby right before the game. It's the funniest <laughs> thing we've ever seen in our lives. We are laughing hysterically. And she has like sweats, like the meat sweats. It's so, it's, <laughs> it's the best thing ever because she's the smallest woman and it's just so out of her comfort zone. And we had the best game of our lives, John and I. I can't speak for Maggie. She was visibly uncomfortable, but it was great. It's hilarious. And we laugh about it to this day. Sometimes I still send them a selfie just to be like, hey, Mag, do you remember this game? <laughs> just to kind of keep it, keep her honest. You know what I mean? But those are the things that, you know, you can't take away from the game. Those are the things that keep you going, especially when you're in the thick of it, for sure. The little things make the biggest difference. And, you know, yeah, the man. business is all about your relationships. They're the return on investment. So just talk to me about three years ago, you make the jump. I know we spoke about it before. Um, yeah. from, what, what were you doing before? Yeah, like I worked in time? nonprofit. Yeah, okay. I worked in nonprofit. Um, I worked for uh, a program that helped 18 to 24 year olds in the inner city of Philadelphia get into tech. So we taught them um, to get certifications. And then my job was to get them hired at third party vendors or obviously hired through Apple or Microsoft or something like that. So, you know, these young guys and girls were unable to get a job. They were unable to go to college and maybe they didn't have the grades, but they did love tech. So we taught them, you know, the inner workings of a computer, of uh, how to operate a network, software, all that stuff. So we use those certifications as a way of having a diploma. And so, you know, it was obviously a very fluid job. I was able to be very um, hands-off in regards of in a specific location, but the emotional need that those young guys and girls needed, they just needed me to be there more. And so, you know, with the travel and with the job demand, I had to make a decision. And, um, you know, basketballs were my first love. I mean, I, I can't, I don't know what to say, but, it's a hard, it's always a hard decision, but it's, it's my decision, you know, and before that I, I worked for Wells Fargo as in business banking. Um, and I left that for nonprofit so that I had more flexibility to work on Saturdays because again, I was pursuing my dream. So, um, you know, making that jump was definitely scary. I talked to every single person I knew that was full-time. I talked to every single person I knew that was a tax person to ask, you know, these very hard questions. My mom thought I was an absolute lunatic. I still think she thinks I'm a little crazy, but, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely an unconventional move. You know, I have went from a very, very solid job and profit to nonprofit, which is very uh, life fulfilling, but not necessarily gives you the highest price tag in regards of your funds. And then I was like, you know what, I'm just going to bet on myself and I'm going to jump, you know? And I think for me, again, not everyone can, can be able to kind of face that fear and walk within that fear and say, Hey, I'm going to just roll the dice. And for me, I just knew I could always go back to this job. I could always go back to Wells Fargo. I didn't leave any job feeling like they wouldn't take me back because that's not how I worked. I was a hard worker. I gave all that I could in those moments, but it was time for me to battle myself, right? Mm -hmm. This was a job that I love. I had opportunities that were coming or that I was hoping that were coming. And I didn't want to be able to say, oh, I'm sorry, I have to work this Saturday or, oh, you know, it's hard for me to get out of the city, you know, and we all face those problems, right? I mean, Paul, you got multiple jobs, man. Like, you know what it's like, mm -hmm. but when you're pursuing something that needs you for six months out of a year, almost every day, you got to do what you got to do, you know? And for me, it was really about the numbers. It was about what was best for my family. It was about, you know, how much I was willing to sacrifice, right? Because even if I bet on myself and I went full time, I could have broke my life. Yeah. Now what, yeah. right? And that was an honest question I had to ask myself. Are you okay when this doesn't work out, right? Yeah. Anytime we go into something, we're always like, oh, it's going to be this, this, and this. It's going to be the best thing ever. But we never think about, what could happen if it doesn't, you know? And I think when you're making that decision, you got to ask yourself those hard questions. What if I fail? Are you okay with that? You know, are you going to be able to come back here to this nonprofit and still give it your all, right? Or, or can you pivot and do something else, right? Little did I know there were a couple of jobs that were put up. There was a, a regional evaluator that was available a couple of years ago. If I broke my leg, I could have went out for that job. I don't know where I got the job, but I'm just saying, it was an opportunity that could have presented itself had I had not been able to make it, right? So you never know where life is going to take you. But if you don't walk through that door when you're standing right in front of it, I worked my butt off to get in front of that door. Now I'm going to, I'm not going to, I can walk through. Are you, are you kidding? You know, I'm, I'm busting through that thing. Hey guys, love you. I'll 
maybe I'll be back. I'll call you occasionally. No, no hard feelings, you know, but I got to bet on myself, you know, and it was scary. I just talked to my tax guy today and I'll still make sure I'm doing all the right things, you know? Yeah. Um, and thankfully my, my fiance has insurance. So I'm on her insurance. I, I have, um, you know, disability insurance in case something happens to me, you know, I pay out of pocket for that, you know, in case, you know, I have to replenish a season's worth of, of cash. Um, you have to allocate your funds appropriately. You know, you got to make sure that you tax yourself appropriately. So you don't have that issue. I mean, there's a lot of things that come on when you, you know, you are your own business, like anyone who's starting a business. But like I said earlier, basketball is, is, is my dream job and any way that I can stay involved with it as long as I can stay involved with it was the best decision for me so if you're thinking about it make sure your numbers add up I'm not going to show you code it it's got to add up it's got to add up and uh, make sure you have a valid plan you know make sure that you're not thinking you're going to do well make sure you have some something to kind of dig your teeth in a little bit right like I had just done division three semifinal I was like okay I'm on my way I'm in a couple of division one conferences, you know, if, if I can just do a, four more games in each conference, I think I'll be okay. Right. So you got to actually logistically figure out if this is the right decision. Don't just jump, have a plan. But once you have the plan, now you got to execute. Okay. Mm -hmm. you can't just sit here and look at the plan all day. You got to execute. You got to make sure that you're available and ready. And if you need to communicate that to your, your coordinators who are wherever they are, make sure that they know that because they're trying to find people to plug in for last minute games. And if they know that you're not working, they can call you on Thursday, right? You're, you shoot yourself right up the ladder. I mean, thankfully my last name starts with a C, so I'm already kind of a little high there, but uh, if they know that you're not, you don't have a job, you know, you have a job, but you don't have a job, they know that they can count on you to do that. So, you know, it's so important to just make sure you communicate in all, all realms, but also make sure that your numbers add up. Don't make that mistake. One more question on that. I think there's a lot of officials that are on the brink. So like, what advice do you have for, let's say a mid-major division one official looking to make that jump to full-time? When do you know you can be do this full-time? Is it just strictly the number of games that you think you're gonna get or? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like I said, I, I, I've had people that I could trust and ask, you know, if you have a mentor, see what, see what they are saying, right? see what they think about where you are in your career. Cause I can think that I'm doing great. <laughs> and the court and the, and the, your mentor is like, Hey, I don't know. You know, it's a couple games, a little shaky there, you know, or they have the ear of a Lisa, a Patty, a Debbie, you know, so they can kind of say, you know, where you are in regards to what they think about you. Right. So if you have a mentor, lean on them, use them. This is the time to get all your money's worth in this moment. Ask them. Um, and if they're unsure and you're unsure, like I said, if you've done the numbers and it makes sense to you, make the jump, right? Because this is the thing, you cannot make the jump and still stay in that middle, get a couple phone calls where you're not available. You can't get out of this meeting, can't get out of this uh, city that you're no longer in because you're in Minnesota for a meeting, you know, or you can, bet on yourself, you're available for that one game they needed you, right? I was available for a game after I quit my job that was on a Sunday at noon in Florida. I would never be available for that game because I'm probably getting ready for work the next day. And how the heck am I getting home if it's at noon? There's probably no flight home from Florida to Philadelphia, but I don't have to go to work on Monday. So I'm available, right? That game just happened to be on ESPN, I did a good job, didn't screw anything up. Thank you, God. <laughs> and now that helps me for that coordinator to trust me another time, right? So you never know when you get that call. So if you're doing a solid job in the mid-major, you feel like you're in a decent hunt. Maybe you're getting some playoff games. Dude, you gotta bet on yourself, man. You gotta make that jump. You gotta do what you think is best for you. And it's kind of a gut thing too, Paul. You can't just, I mean, Yes, I would love to have a great streamline for how you can be successful, but some stuff is just the gut. I mean, it's like the game. You can tell someone this is a 50-50 call, but it's also what has the game provided to you, right? Yeah. What have we had the whole game? Good point. You got to make that decision based off of what we need for this game. Also, what it looks like, right? So like, if you are like, yeah, I'm really not sure, you got to make a decision. You can't just have bodies on the floor, right? It's a feel thing. 
you got to make that decision. So if you feel as though this is your time, this is your right time, better yourself, do what you got to do. And if not, guess what? You're still a really great mid-major official. You're still getting quality games. Try again another couple of years. Ask the people around you what you need to do to make that step. Don't be afraid to ask those questions. That's one thing when I was coming through and even to, to say, I'll ask the question. I have no problem doing that. I, if I need that information, I will find a way to get it. How else are you going to get it? They're not going to just tell you. They don't know what you're trying to look for. They don't know the question you need. Ask the question. I get officials ask me questions all the time. I'm going to tell you the truth. Don't, I mean, don't ask me if you don't want the truth, but I'm going to tell you the truth, right? And that's all people need. If you can handle that, then you'll, you'll make the next step. It'll be just fine. Natasha, you obviously have a lot of passion for the game and you're clearly enjoying the process of reaching your goals and beyond. Yeah. Can you expand on all the things you love about officiating? Yeah, man. Oh. I mean, if you played, you just love the game, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you go and you check the balls and you're like, man, I mean, just this year, okay? We didn't know we were going to have a season. We didn't know anything, right? It's, uh, my fiance made fun of me because like I heard like some sneakers screeching in the off season. I was like, oh, what's that? You know, it's just, <laughs> it's Grab just like the most simplest things that you took care of it, you know? Um, the horns, you know, it's just all the things that we're so familiar with. And I, you know, sometimes I've had a long day, maybe three flights haven't gone. I didn't get a chance to take my nap. My meditation was only 15 minutes and not 30. I didn't get a quality lunch. You know, things are just going hell in a handbasket. And now I get to the game and I got to perform, right? And I am still disgruntled. But as soon as we blow that whistle to throw the ball up, I mean, the euphoria that I have, right? I'm like, man, I made it. I'm here now, right? I can just go do my job. Right now we can break down plays, see what the uh, players are giving you. You know, I don't know if everyone does this, but I try to do like my own scouting report on each team. You know, if I've had similar coaches or coaches before, I know what my communication style needs to be tonight. I know how they like to, um, what are their pain points? You know, what are, who are their people that they're going to be more upset about two, three, four, five fouls on? Um, I understand the type of pace we're going to have. Maybe we're going to have, you know, three point shots on one side, going to the basket on the other side. So now I get to see the things that I project to happen are going to happen or not, right? Maybe the best player tonight is her. I walked into the gym, felt fully prepared. Best player down. I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen now. Because that's the whole team, yeah. right? And then that team shows up with another player and you're like, wow, this is awesome, right? Because now you get to learn even more about other players off the bench. And if you're true, student of the game, true person who's passionate about the game, that stuff gets you, gets you fired up. You know, when you kind of make those calls that again are uncomfortable, but you know, it's the right thing for the game. I know for me, that makes me feel good. You know, I don't want anyone to be upset, but I want to do what's right for the game. I want both teams to have an opportunity to win as fairly as possible. And if I'm on the game and I'm with the crew, I want us to do the best job that we can so that when we leave, no one remembers us. I've gone to gyms and they're like, have you been here before? I'm like, I have. And the fact that you don't remember is perfect, right? I don't want you to, I don't want you to remember anything that's like gonna make you feel jumpy, but I want you to know that when I come through, me and whoever I'm working with, we're gonna do the best job that we can to make sure that this game goes as best as it can. And, you know, just the intensity and just working them and seeing how fluid they can be is just phenomenal. And, and so many other teams that we have and that we work are, they work their butts off. You know, the teams I got the chance to work this year, they work their butts off. And the ability to kind of see that firsthand, you know, I, I jokingly said to you before we got started, I went to the dentist today and she was like, I heard that you're an official. And so she's asking me about various teams and she's like, is it true? Is it, you know, is, are they really that good? Is they really? And I'm like, yeah, man, women's basketball is flourishing. It's blossoming. It's one of the best things to me to watch because as a team sport, you know, these coaches put their heart and soul into strategy and figuring out what's best. Uh, and I just really love being a part of that. I love that I'm an integral part of that, but I'm not the reason for anything. You know, I just want to make sure that I bring my part to that game. You know, these girls work out you know, almost 12 months a year for these moments. And we do the same, you know, and I want to make sure that when we show up or when I show up, 
and I'm bringing my best and that, you know, that game goes well because I love the game so much. It's given so much to me. Love that. Um, yeah. You mentioned communication with coaches and my eyes started to light up because it's one of my favorite topics to talk about. Oh, <laughs> Well, we need a lot of help in that area. And you know, obviously yeah, how man. difficult they can be. So we try to put out yep. tips to help yep. officials kind of deal and, and respond effectively. What's kind yeah. of your communication style when you have to go speak to a coach? Well, again, everyone's so different, right? So I, I always start out um, pretty dry. Coach or, you know, Tom, Don, Bill, whoever, you know, um, and I just try to answer the question that they're asking, right? So, you know. Natasha, how is that a foul? How is that a foul? It's a foul because your player was not moving laterally and obliquely to maintain legal guarding position. She moved into the offensive player. It's a foul. Great. Now, you might say, Paul, come on, Tasha, what you really think? I might say, oh, thank God. Coach, she wasn't there. She bumped her, right? Each coach is going to give you a different thing. Each coach is going to try to feel you out, especially if they don't know you, right? They're going to try to see what's going on. You know, I've had conversations with coaches where on film, I'm like, man, it really looks like they like me. And they're tearing me up, right? You don't have to have the last word. Another veteran official told me, you don't have to have the last word. Duke, Duke Callahan, at, Joe, at um, Joey's camp, again, didn't know what that meant. But you don't have to have the last word. Okay. You can say your piece. They say their piece. Maybe they say something else. Take a step back. Let them, you know, have a little bit of energy as long as it's not disrespectful. And that's it. Right. Because again, it's just that moment. They're competitive. They're trying to win. They're also coaching 18, 24 year olds. God bless them. Right. I hope they pay attention. I hope they listen. And I'll say that to them. You know, I've said to coaches in transition who are frustrated, maybe we didn't even get along. And I'll say, man, you, you want to switch? And they're like, nah, man. You know, like just, <laughs> just to kind of break it up, you know, just to kind of give a little bit of like humility, a little bit of humanism to that moment. And they're like, oh no, you know, because they know that our job is just as hard. And I'm looking at them like, I know your job is just as hard, you know? And I think for me, what works well for me is again, being myself, right? I like to crack jokes. I also like to be a little bit of, you know, to be a little bit smart ass sometimes you know but not in a disrespectful way but in a way that allows everyone to kind of go that was you know what okay you know what i mean like hey she hit her on the arm okay fine you know like i wouldn't call a coach if i didn't feel like that was a foul or if you don't agree i'll say you know what you know what i'll be here in a couple of weeks i'll take a look at it and, I, and I'll, i've said that to a coach hey coach you know what we may not agree on that if i'm wrong i'll eat it I'll, I'll look at it after the game, like I always do. And if I'm wrong, next time I see you, I'll tell you I'm wrong. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, for real. And if I'm wrong, I'll deliver. Because again, we're not going to have a perfect game, man. You know, and I think that they understand that and they know that. I had a tough play in the NCAA tournament. I just did not get right. I mean, it just, we had an RA LDB play and I just sniffed it. You know, I just didn't make the right call. And so I go over to the coaches and they're, you know, standing there ready to give me all, all hell. And I just went to them and I said, I, I won't say what exactly what I said. I say, I missed the call. And they were like, okay. And, and what else are you going to say? You know, I said, I feel bad about it. I feel terrible. I said, but there's, there's nothing I can say that's going to change this, this moment. I'm, I, mess, I messed it up and I'm sorry. And honestly, I'm surprised it worked, but it worked. But I was genuine and I was being honest. And that's exactly what it was. There's nothing I could have said in that moment to make that better. That's what it was. You know, and I think a lot of times the officials, we try to snow them. We try to give them breathisms, you know, not right now, coach, or here's your hand. It's like, come on, come on, come on. You know, be a human being for crying out loud. You know, interact with them. And again, times that I've had to, you know, give out a technical to a coach, I say to younger officials when they have issues with coaches, I'll say to them, take that interaction off the court and put it outside, put it in a shopping mall, put it in a bar, put it in a restaurant. Would you allow someone to talk to you that way? Mm. No, right? So then what are we talking about, right? And that, and that's kind of how I deal with those very difficult situations. I think to myself, you know, is this appropriate outside of basketball? No, no absolutely not, right? So, okay, coach, that's enough, I've had enough. Because now 
we're crossing that line, right? There's a difference between you and I kind of having some banter, you and I disagreeing, you and I talking about looking at it later, what have you, right? But I'm not gonna keep being yelled at. I don't wanna hear have constant complaining if it's not valid questions, because I can't focus. That's just being fair, you know? And you're not gonna be disrespectful because I'm not being disrespectful to you. I think that that's fair. I think all of those things are fair, even in competition. Right. And I, you can ask anyone. I don't even give out that many technicals. I think that they're worthy when they need to be. But I think that a lot of things can be talked through. I think it's a lot of listening on our part. And I think there's a lot of communication errors, like you kind of mentioned, that we all make their side and our side. But again, just trying to be the best myself. I say, hey, I don't I don't, I don't need you yelling at me, man. I'll say that, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, it kind of gets them out of that, that mode because I'm like, I'm standing right here. I came over to you because I want to discuss it. Why, you know, why are you still yelling at me? It's, it's an honest question. I'm not trying to be facetious or funny. I just really want to know why we're still yelling at one another when I came across the court to you. I brought myself to you, right? So have some, so have some uh, ability to kind of communicate in a way that we can understand each other. That's all I'm trying to do. I want to do the best job for you. I want both teams to have a fair chance, but I don't need to be on that. And I don't need to be disrespected. I work my butt off to be here. You work your butt off to be here. Let's treat each other with the same respect. Some great, great tips there. Um, you know, I love what you said about accountability. When, when you're accountable to, let's say, your particular play, you take away all of their ammunition. Now they have yep. nothing left. They, they shot their whole bullet in, and you took it in the chest. Now they have, they have no more. Nothing. And at that point, you know, I have, you know, obviously to each his own, where there wasn't really a play that they could really hang their hat on. But I was like, you know what? You can you can hang your hat on that, and that's fine. You know, I don't feel great about it, but I'm not gonna come over here and give you crap. I'm just gonna take it, I'm gonna take it. I'm not gonna take, again, disrespect, but I will take you being upset. That's fair. That's all in the fear of basketball. It's fine, no big deal. I liked how you used the leverage of, of you know, just using normal conversation voices why are you still yelling at me i like to say coach coach i would never speak yeah. to you the way you're i would never speak yes. to you that way yes it yeah. provokes yeah. a little empathy and that's what we're looking to get in these situations sure sure and i've had coaches say well i'm upset Tosh. i'm like i understand you're upset but i'm standing right next to you tell me what you're upset about you know because the more that we spend time you yelling and doing the i can't get to the root cause of what you're trying to talk about Right. And that's really what I'm trying to communicate is what is the issue that we're having? Maybe you feel like they're getting more calls. Maybe you feel like your best player is getting bumped. These are all quality concerns that I want to have and hear and share with my crew. But I can't hear it if you're yelling at me. And I also can't hear it if you're talking about things that don't have anything to do with why you're really upset. What are you really upset right, about? Right. Nine to two, nine to two. No. What did you have a question? Was there something that you feel as though it's different? And I'll say, coach, you're shooting threes. They're going to the basket. We have two totally different styles of basketball. This is quarter one. The next two quarters could be two to nine, two to nine. You know, it's, it's a game of flows, right? So give us a moment. Let us work a little bit. You know, let both teams adjust. We're going to be good. Trust us. You know, and obviously... <laughs> As a crew, we got to deliver, right? I can't be throwing out these trust those things and we're, we're screwing up the game. But again, you know, we put a lot of effort into being the best that we can be. So have some confidence in, in your homework and your preparation. What do you like to say when coaches throw out the foul count and try to hang it over your head like it's leverage? Mm, I don't do that. Mm -mm. I just say, well, we're not doing that. Again, do you have a question? What plays do you think that we're missing? Whatever the conversation is. And then I'll just say, coach, I also want to bring to your attention that you, you know, if it's a, a style discrepancy, which, you know, I kind of, again, I prepared myself for this possibility. We have a team that's more of a three-point shooting team versus a team that likes to drive the basket to the hole. We're going to have more decisions on different styles of play. So I already know this might be a, a, a point of contention, right? Or maybe they're trying to take charges, but they're not very good at being legally at taking these charges. So, you know, it's a gamble, right? So I'll say, coach, you know, we've had some more difficult plays that didn't go in your favor. And the other team is shooting threes. You know, let's see how the game continues. If you feel as though there's certain plays that we're missing, are there screens, are there bumps? You know, we'll look for those, but the the, the foul count is not helpful. 
I don't, I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and I'm just being honest. I mean, that's, I would talk to anyone like that if, if I was at work or if I was outside, you know, if I'm trying to get to the root cause of whatever our issue is, let's just talk about that. Nine to two, seven to that doesn't mean anything. I don't know what that means. What am I missing? What are we missing? How can we make this better? Because this isn't, this, that type of communication is not going to work. You want to hear my response to that? Oh, I love it. Let's hear it. Paul, the fouls are seven, one coach. I'm aware of the time. I'm aware of the score and I'm aware of the foul count. That's yeah. the last time we're going to talk about the scoreboard. Do you have a question about a play? Yeah, we have different styles. <laughs> no, they, different styles. You got to listen find what works again. For you. It might work for you, Paul. That's what I'm saying. It might work for me. I mean, I'm just like, I, I like to be as even as I can be. So I'm like, yeah, I'm not. And there's only a couple of times I've gotten really jumpy, like really animated because it's just like you cross the line. But I try to just to stay calm, man. I mean, again, even after this moment, I got to go back to doing my job. So I can't be so riled up in this moment because now there's another play that I might miss because I'm thinking about how mad I am still at you. I got to stay calm. Like I said, I don't have time for fear. I have time for anger. I just need to freaking focus, man. I got to just do my job. That's it. How can I handle this? I try to say it in a calm manner. I'm just excited to talk to you. So I was, you know, I was like, <laughs> so, Paul. I, I was like, man, you're better than me, bro. <laughs> well, listen, but, but, you know, my thing is when they throw things that are unsportsmanlike and, you know, that's technically a technical foul. You're saying we're cheating. You're, yeah. you're questioning my integrity. So that's kind yeah. of where I think there's an ability to play offense and totally run the conversation and shut sure. them down, you know? I mean, I think it depends on who, who and how it's done. You know, sure. like I'll have more mild manner coaches say to me, Tasha, seven to two. I'm like, fair. I've had coaches say to me, seven to two. Coach, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. so you have a question. Again, I'm not going to come. I'm not going to meet that with that. I'm always going to meet it with, with calm and poise. That's just my personality and my style. And it, again, I'm not saying it's the right way, but it's worked well for me. So at least they know the next time they have a question, maybe they'll come with a different tone. Maybe they'll come in a different way because you don't have to talk to me like that. Mm -hmm. And again, it's quarter one, it's quarter two, whatever it is. Or I'll say, coach, the last three quarters has been in your favor. Like we didn't just arrive here. The game ebbs and flows. Now someone has to win. The intensity is higher. That's where we are. You know, and I'll just be honest, but I, I can't not, you know, I'm not going to continue this conversation. I'm going to address it in the way that I feel appropriate. And then that's it. If we keep going to your point, Paul, okay, now we got a warning. Now we got a technical, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and prayerful that we can address this in a way that are adults mm -hmm. and we can figure out a way to kind of move on from this issue. That was great. Thank you for sharing all of that, um, you know, strategies for communicating yeah. coaches yeah. and managing the game. I'm sure you've had many moments that stood out along your career, but can you elaborate on a couple of your most memorable games? Sure. Um, man. I kind of touched on the one from the uh, uh, round two games. That was awesome. Just an amazing atmosphere, wall to wall fans. Again, I'm not from there. Uh, my family and friends watched and I had a call that they didn't like, uh, which was right by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think I got booed for like three possessions and it was pretty awesome. I like jokingly said they booed me all the way back to Philadelphia, which is like hilarious, but I was like 3000 miles. So, I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, that's what we love about it too, though. Like no one can sit here and say they don't love that good feeling, you know? Um, and then more recently, you know, I got an opportunity to do a very uh, great matchup for Lisa's conference this year. And um, it was probably one of the biggest games of my career to this moment. And um, it was super, super exciting to be there and to like have the lights and all of that you know all the things that we dream of of like being on the floor um and then the game starts and you're like oh it's the same game I've been doing all these other nights you know uh but you don't know that until you're there right but it was memorable because you know I had dreamed of this particular matchup of being called my number being called for that matchup um and getting that opportunity to do it and getting that opportunity to make mistakes and grow from it and, and to really kind of pull from those, those moments now and share them, you know, and, and help other officials grow so that when their time comes and their numbers call, maybe they don't make the same mistakes. Maybe they have better preparation. Maybe they, 
whatever it is they need to do so that they're even better than I am, right? That's all about giving back. It's all about pulling people from behind you. Um, and that's what everyone that I mentioned on this um, and, and people that, you know, that I've interacted with maybe in small spurts, you know, helped me. They gave me nuggets as I came along. And um, I'm so grateful for that because I was able to kind of come into that moment and be ready for that moment. But man, it was exhilarating. And afterwards, you know, uh, Lisa actually called the crew and talked to us and told us how proud of us she was and how good of a game it was to watch. Um, and, you, you know, that doesn't always happen. You're, for, you know, coordinators are busy. They have tons of things to do. But uh, just having that moment with my crew and, and with her and uh, her understanding that, you know, one of the younger officials on this crew might need that call uh, was was great. It was great. It's a feather in the old cap. And, you know, you hope you get the opportunity again. You hope that you continue to get opportunities. Uh, but it was it was a fantastic moment. I can't, can't, even, can't say it enough. Well, Natasha, I really appreciate you. You've, you've brought a lot. You've brought a lot of great energy, a lot of positivity, a lot of knowledge and experience. And I know a lot of uh, members of the audience are going to really appreciate it. I can't wait to go back and, and listen to this myself. Is there anything that you would like to leave the dedicated audience of basketball officials with before you go? Yeah, man, I, I would just say, you know, if anything, if you got anything from today, you know, just continue to work hard. You know, appreciate those moments, appreciate the journey. You know, I think for me, starting out so young as I did and still being young, I feel, uh, you know, you don't take pride in the, in the journey sometimes, you know, and I think for me, having those setbacks like we discussed earlier, having some of those, those kind of really uh, moments where I thought, man, I thought it was my turn, you know, uh, I understood I needed to enjoy the journey, you know, and that every single time that maybe I was climbing that mountain, I had to come back down a couple steps or maybe I had to wait the storm out, you know, maybe it wasn't my turn, you know, and that's okay. Doesn't mean that you're doing wrong. Doesn't mean that, you know, you're not gonna make it. It just means that right now, there's something else that you need to work on. There's something else that you need to focus on. Maybe it's something even at home. You know, maybe your family needs you after March 13th. So you can't continue to the NCAA tournament. Think about what you get to experience instead of, right? And use this stuff to channel your own inner drive. Because, you know, I can tell you, hey, quit your job, become full time, but you gotta make that decision. Trust yourself. Bet on yourself and never stop learning. I mean, that's, I mean, those, those are the keys to life, but I mean, just for this job alone, you know, don't ever stop learning. Don't ever stop being hungry and always, always, always give back and try to grow the game. Thank you so much for that, Natasha. Yeah. And Thanks, Paul. Appreciate your time, man. This was awesome. I, again, I don't know how you found me, but here we are, brother. Here we are. Hope to meet you one day. And to everyone yeah. listening, thank you for listening to episode four of the wonderful women of officiating only on the audio experience for basketball officials the crown rest podcast we will see you next time peace thank you for listening to the crown refs podcast serve the game